thank you children and thank you Lori for leading them and y'all in this you know these, these days that we live in our children need to constantly be reminded of God's sovereignty and his goodness and his faithfulness and the fact that God is in control can you imagine being a young child growing up in our culture I, I really just you know our heart breaks aches for young families uh, you mothers and fathers that are raising these young children and and so much that is heaped upon them uh, in our culture is just it's just crazy so any time and every time that you have an opportunity to to have your children in church and I don't mind saying that in church in Sunday school in in youth group um, that's where they need to be um, they might spend one or two hours here they spend 160 some hours out there in the world um, so anyhow enough about that I, I have an awful introduction to this morning's sermon so I'm just going to kind of can that and just talk to you from my heart how many of you just watch the news and you see how amazing Israel is um, what uh, what strong leadership they have how they are folks Israel's problem is an existential problem. Israel's problem is they are fighting for their lives. They are surrounded on all sides by, uh, by their enemies, and yet somehow they, they, they tend to thrive, not just survive. What's up with that? Who is Israel? What is Israel? Is Israel, are Israel God's chosen people? Um, what's going on with them? Why is it, and I'm unabashedly unashamed that, that uh, I'm a huge supporter of Israel. I believe we should be a huge supporter of Israel. But why? Are, are, are they unique in God's great plan? And so if, if they were unique in God's great plan, if God's blessing was upon Israel uh, for God's purposes, are they still unique? Is there a special place in God's plan for Israel? Do, do you ever think about these things? Uh, I, I mean, I do all the time. I think about it a lot. It, it's, a, it's a difficult topic in some respects. Well, when we get to Romans chapter 9, Romans chapter 10, and Romans chapter 11, we come to Paul's summary, his dialogue, his treatise about God's vindication of Israel. Um, I won't lie to you. I mean, I hope I would never lie to you. I just say that. But I won't lie to you. <clears throat> chapter 9, 10, and 11 are difficult chapters. They really are. As we get into it, I think you're going to understand why. Uh, there's much grace that should be given. It's like when we talk about eschatology, right? When we discuss uh, the end times and the various views of the rapture and the millennial and uh, the millennial age and pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, all millennialism, post-millennialism, whatever. Uh, there, there has to be lots of grace shared within the church over these things. So as we talk about this subject, um, I pray that you will give and receive grace. Now, today's topic isn't so controversial. We'll save that for uh, next week and the week after and the week after and the week after that. Um, but today I want us to kind of jump back into Romans. It's been four Sundays since we talked about Romans. We had a hurricane in the midst of that. We uh, talked about a couple of the Psalms. Uh, you know, we weren't able, I wasn't able to be here last Sunday. So very thankful for Jason for being willing and able to, to come preach. He's a great preacher. Really is. He knows God's Word. So very thankful we could call on him. But with all of that lead in, so I thought about how, how do we get caught up? How do we kind of learn again what we've spent several months learning in the first eight chapters of Romans? What's the best way of doing that? Well, I can remember as a young believer... 
uh, being told or taught the Romans road. Have you ever heard that before? You ever been taught the Romans road? How many of you know what I'm talking about when I say the Romans road? Raise your hand. You know what I'm talking about? Because I'm going to call on you. Raise your hand. I'm going to call on you if you're saying that, that I know what you're talking about. So raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. One person knows what I'm talking about now. <clears throat> Well, when I was a, a younger Christian, uh, we were taught the, the, the Romans Road plan of salvation. That's a very handy-dandy kind of way. Sometimes you can even find them on, on bookmarks, even now. Uh, it will list several verses, and it's, a, it's a, um, uh, a very easy way to kind of just do a quick inventory of, of you know, where you stand with God. So I thought we would just do that real briefly this morning, just kind of go through the Romans Road just to find out where we are. It will help us come up to speed on where we've been these past few months, and then we're going to tackle uh, very briefly today verses 1 through 5 of chapter 9 of Romans. So let's just talk a little bit about the Romans road. Um, the, the first verse that we find in the Romans road is oftentimes chapter 1 verses 16 and 17. It says this, Paul writes, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Everyone who believes, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So we saw this very early on, that there's good news, it's called the gospel, uh, in this world in which we live in, in which we're surrounded by lots of bad news, lots of junk, there is good news. And there is a gospel, and the, the, the gospel is about the righteousness of God. Now, Martin Luther would wrestle and wrestle and wrestle with this idea of the righteousness of God to the point where Martin Luther was asked, you know, Martin Luther, how much do you love God? He said, love God. So many times I hate God. Because Martin Luther at that time, he could not grasp, he could not understand God's righteousness uh, as it related to his sin. Martin Luther was very aware of his sinful estate before a holy God. Every time he would talk about the righteousness of God, all he could do was see his, his filthiness. It was like looking in a beautiful, perfect mirror and seeing what we really look like. And that's what Martin Luther would do. And he said, I, I, I would hate God because I, I've just felt his, his vindictive hand all over me until the time where Martin Luther came to understand what the righteousness of God really means in this, in this context. The righteousness of God is not talking about this inherent righteousness, this purity of who God is. God is righteous, but he's talking about this righteousness, this estate, this state of being that God possesses, that God will give to those whom he calls to himself. So there's a verdict then as we go down the Roman road, and that's in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. It says this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We saw this. Paul worked his way through chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3, and not only were uh, Gentiles lost and hopeless and helpless, but so are Jews, God's chosen elect people, that we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Some might seem to come closer than others, but we all fall short. It's kind of like trying to jump over Grand Canyon. You ever been out to the Grand Canyon? That's, a, that's an amazing place, isn't it? I mean, you stand there and you look down the wall and it's like, well, let's all line up and try to jump across the Grand Canyon. Who's going to, you know, um, you, you know, Anthony, little Anthony right there, man, you might run and do 20 feet, jump 20 feet out there and you're going to still fall short about a mile from getting to the other side. Uh, but then some of the rest of us, Kelly, she might jump five feet. Somebody in a wheelchair might just roll and just fall off the edge. Right? But we all fall short. That's, that's where we are. That, that's, that's the guilt that we face before God. There's the verdict. All have sinned and we fall short of God's holy demands. I would just ask you today, if you were to die today and stand before God, because listen, you're going to die one day. You know that. We don't like to talk about death, do we? In fact, we euphemize death. We don't, we don't talk about he died. We talk about he passed away. He went to the other side or something like that. 
But you know what? <clears throat> My friend this morning, you might have come here just hoping to hear some rosy little <clears throat> pithy sayings. Uh, you're going to hear this morning that all of us are sinners. All of us will die. One day, your life will come to an end. It's going to happen unless Jesus returns first. And when you die, you stand before a holy God. And He were to look at you in your eyes and say, why should I let you into heaven? What are you going to say? What's your answer going to be? I'm, I'm being serious right now. What's your answer going to be? You know, is it going to be something like, you know, God, I've really tried hard. I know I wasn't perfect, but I, but I wasn't as bad as I could have been. I never, I never murdered. I, I, you know, I wasn't too bad, God. Y'all, you know, that's not going to hack it, right? I mean, that just that one little sin is enough to send us to hell. But I just want you to grasp that. The verdict is that, that we're all going to die. As you get older, you realize how true that is. <clears throat> you know, when you're 12 years old, when you're 15 years old, when you're 18 years old, man, there's no problem that's not insurmountable. I can do anything. I'm never going to get ill and die. And then you get to your 40s and your 50s and your 60s and they start taking all these test when you go to the doctor and they're telling you this is wrong and this is, this is off and this is off. You know, and, and it's kind of like putting patches on the inner tube. I mean, it, really it is. Your, your life is like putting patches on the inner tube. You put one here and, and you go a year or two and you put one there and you go a year or two and you, you do your very best and we all do our very best. And men, I mean, how many of you go to the doctors and they treat you and you go back to the doctor and they treat you and you're good for a year or two and you go back and they treat you, but, you know, then eventually, y'all, you're going to die. Eventually it's over. Have you really come to grasp that truth? One day, friend, you and I will die. And they'll put your body in a casket. And they'll roll it down in front of a preacher. And he'll say some flowery words and nice words and then... They'll close the casket and they'll go put you in the ground and they'll put dirt over you and they'll all meet together in the church fellowship hall and have fried chicken and potato salad. You know it's true. And you know this? In 50 years, no one on the face of this planet will ever knew you lived. That's how the preacher could say it's all vanity. How vain is life? What, what's the purpose? We come and we live briefly. Like a little squirt of Febreze. I'm addicted to air fresh Febreze. I'll go in the bathroom and just grab the can and just spray a little spray and just stand under it and just let it float down. I love it. It, it just brings memories, that, that scent. But the, the scent, the mist, it kind of rains down and you smell it for a second and it's gone. And that's what the Bible says our lives are. They're like a mist. They're here and then gone. You might be living in the prime of your life right now and you think, man, i got so much life to live. There's so much ahead of me. How do you know that? How do you know that? How do you know that today is not your last day on this planet? You don't know that. It might be. 
You might drop dead this afternoon. That's the grim reality of life. And I'm just telling you, my friend, if you're not ready to meet your maker, when you die, it's absolutely too late. And no one on this earth, when you are dead, will be able to pray you into heaven. There is no such thing as purgatory. That's the verdict. The sentence is found in Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is what? Death. The wages of sin is death. I just elaborated on that, that we'll all die. And we get what's coming to us. Right? God told... Adam and Eve, he says, the day that you eat of that forbidden fruit, you'll surely die. Did they die that day? Well, in one sense, they did. Spiritually, they died. They were separated from God. But then there was a sentence put on their lives. That body is going to die because of sin. That's why we die to this day. So you're going to die. The wages of sin is death. There's hope. We're still on that Romans road. There's hope. Romans 5, 8 says this, but God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He died as a substitute. He died as a sacrifice. He died to, as, as an atoning sacrifice to pay the price for that sin, that awful sin that pits us against God. The Bible says that He shows His love for us while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Listen, church, Jesus did not die a generic Savior. He did not die for generic sins. Jesus died for particular sins, for particular people like you and me. That's the hope. But then there's a promise. Romans 10, 9 says this, <clears throat> because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, if you believe in your heart that God is raised from the dead, you will be saved. I love promises. I love people who keep promises. I love it when the telephone company, uh, or, or, and I'm very, very thankful here, at CJ, uh, for, for the people who work for a particular company here. You know who they are. Uh, when you call them here in this county, they come that day. They say, we're on our way, and they'll be here. It's not like that in other places of the country. I can tell you that. You call and they say, well, well, we'll try to be there, and they try to be there, and they never are. Don't you just dislike people that don't keep promises? Don't make a promise if you can't keep it. We're cool. But God makes His promise. He says, if you confess with your mouth, in other words, if you're not ashamed of Christ, if you confess with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is King. Jesus is divinely sovereign. Jesus is good. Jesus is Alpha and Omega. Jesus is the Lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. If you confess this with your mouth, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed to be called a Christian. I'm not ashamed to pick up my Bible and come to church on Sundays. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart the gospel story, that Jesus was every bit a man as you are a man. And He lived on this planet and He thirsted and He, he was hungry 
and he ached, and he sweat, and he bled. And he was crucified on a Roman cross, and he died. If you believe in your heart that gospel truth, that God the Father raised Jesus from the dead. Listen, church, He did not swoon on the cross. He, he did not just pass out and they put Him in a cool tomb and that just woke Him up. It is not a fable invented by people who would support Jesus. Y'all, the world changed 2,000 years ago. Why is today 2024? Because something so radical changed. It affected this world dramatically. It affected uh, 11 apostles who were embarrassed, who ran from Christ. When it was time to stand up for Jesus, they ran, they fled. But something happened and it changed their lives. No longer would they flee. In fact, they would stand and die for Christ. Who dies for a lie? Knowingly. Who gives their life for an imposter? The Bible says this is a promise of God. If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, we believe in our heart that God raised it from the, gra from the grave. If we believe that this Bible is true, listen, here's the promise, church. You will be saved. That's a promise. God's promise. I love it when God makes promises. Because God doesn't change His mind. Romans 10, 13 says this, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You mean me? Yes, that means you. You mean God would still save me knowing what I've lived like, knowing what I've thought like, knowing how I've failed Him, knowing how my direction has not been where He's wanted me to go, knowing where my priorities have been? God would still even save me? My sin's not too big? No, your sin's not too big. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's kind of the quick and dirty of Romans chapters 1 through 8. Uh, not even mention a lot of the good stuff. Uh, Fail to mention that we are no longer enemies of God. We have peace with God through Christ. We're no longer of Adam, we're of Christ. We have union with Christ. We have died with Christ. We've been raised with Christ. Ephesians says we are seated in the heavenlies with Christ. We are now no longer slaves to sin, but slaves to righteousness. We have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And yes, there are sufferings now, but Paul would say, he says, I, I tell you this, the sufferings that we're experiencing now, man, they don't, they, you can't even put them on the same radar with the glory that will be revealed to us. Some of you have loved ones that you miss dearly. They may have died 60 years ago. You still miss them like they died last night. <clears throat> it's not sacrilegious to say, you know what, I can't wait to see granddaddy again. That's not sacrilegious. There's everything good about that. Because if granddaddy was in Christ and you're in Christ, you're going to see him again. The sufferings now are not 
worthy of comparing. So you would think, you think Paul goes through, <coughs> excuse me, Paul goes through chapters 1 through 8, and, it, and it's just amazing. In fact, he ends in verses 31 through 39 of chapter 8. I won't read them all, but basically he ends by saying, For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God through Christ Jesus our Lord. There's nothing out there that can ever separate us. There's nothing that's ever going to happen. It doesn't matter if this world ends in nuclear war. It doesn't matter if you get some crazy disease and die. It doesn't matter if you get the worst sentence that the doctor could give you. It doesn't mean if the government comes and hauls you off to jail and you go to prison for the rest of your life. It doesn't matter. Nothing will separate us from the love of God that is in Christ. Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. And so you would think, I mean, this, this is the climax. Paul is going, man, it doesn't get any better with this. And, and, and based on the other letters that he's written, you would expect Paul to say something like this. Therefore, therefore, based on all of the glory of God and what He's done for you and how good the gospel is and how much He's loved you and He ran to you and you didn't run to Him. Based on that, now, live your lives accordingly. Line up your life with the truth of the gospel. Church, become who you already are in Christ. That's what you would think He would say. That's not what Paul says. Paul says, Has God failed His Word? <laughs> it's su a surprising twist. Has God failed? Has God forgotten His people? Paul would say, I'm just going to go fast here. I, Paul would say in verses 1 through 5 of chapter 9, like in verses 4 and 5 in particular, he would say, Israel. Israel is God's called people. They're His elect people. Look at all the promises, the privileges that God gave Israel. And then he lists some things there in your Bible. You can see verses 4 and 5. In fact, verse 4. Does somebody have verse 4 and 5? You could just read those out loud, real loud right now. Somebody read it. Chapter 9, verses 4 and 5. Laura, you want to? Please. Okay, so he lists things here about Israel. He says, he says look, at, look at my kinsmen. These are my, my brothers. And he lists these things of the adoption. What does he mean by adoption? He says, you know what? There was this guy Abraham living out in, in Ur of the Chaldees. His family worshipped the stars. That's who he was. He was worshipping the stars. And God, for God's own purposes, God calls Abraham out and says, you are going to be the father of a multitude of nations. Those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. I'll give you a promised land. I'm going to give you more children than there are stars in the sky. And Abraham, you know the story, and, and, and he talks here, and then he talks about the, the, the covenants, and God makes a covenant with Abraham, and he makes a covenant with Moses and, and, and the people to live in the land. Here are my commandments, the Ten Commandments, and here are other laws for how you can prosper in the land. So there's the adoption, there, there's covenants, there's the giving of the law. He gives them the law so that they can live in the land. God loved them so much that He would say, you know what, you do this, don't do that. The glory. He, he says, the, the glory pertains to Israel. You remember, they're, they're captive in Egypt and He's bringing them out of Egypt. And He leads them how? By a pillar of fire by night, cloud by day. God's Shekinah glory falls upon Moses. Moses is there meeting with God. And the Bible says Moses comes out after meeting face to face with God. And the people said, we can't look at you. Your face is so radiant. 
the glory of God. Folks, I'll ask you this. Did the Lord God ever do such a thing for any other people? Did he ever give laws for any other people? Did he ever display his radiant glory to any other people? No. Did he ever adopt any other people but Israel? No. Such were the patriarchs. We know the, the Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the twelve tribes of Jacob. We know the story. And Joseph, the, the, one of the youngest children and how God used that whole thing, sells them off into slavery. And you, you know that story. I'll ask you this. Did God ever do such a thing for any other people? We can read of the other patriarchs. David. Solomon. Uh, but then he, as she read, uh, lastly, the Messiah. I'll ask you, did God ever elect another people from whom the Savior of the world must come? The answer is no, absolutely not. And so, so Paul, is, he's, he's gone through chapters 1 through 8, and he says, God is glorious, He's magnificent. Who could ever separate us from the love of God? And here are the privileges of Israel, given all of these things. And then Paul says, but I have great sorrow in my heart. I have unceasing anguish in my heart. Why? Verse 3. Because my kinsmen, Israel, don't know Christ. He says, I wished that, listen, he says, I wished that I could be damned and sent to hell if my kinsman Israel would know Christ. That's serious business, y'all. In verse 1, uh, Paul puts himself under oath. He says, I, you know, I, this, this is absolute truth. I lie not. I'm telling you the truth in Christ. He puts himself under oath. Uh, in, in verse 2, he says, that there's, there's sorrow, there's anguish in my heart. And he says, he gives us the reason why, because of Israel. If we jump ahead to chapter 10, verse 1, he says, my heart is broken because Israel is not saved. Israel is not saved. He says, may I be damned. May the, the word is anathema. May I be accursed. And so Paul now in chapters 9, 10, and 11, he's going to expand on Israel, ethnic Israel. So let me just close this message today with with two final applications, and we'll, I'll just make these applications in the form of a question or questions. Number one is this. To what extent is your heart broken for your kinsmen? To what extent is there anguish in your heart for your lost family members? Why is it that we're not sorrowful and anguish in our hearts. I'll give you three reasons why I think that, that our hearts don't burn, our hearts aren't sorrowful, our hearts aren't filled with anguish. Three possibilities. Number one is, num is we ourselves are lost. We're just lost. We don't understand the ramifications of what it means to die without Christ. We don't recognize our own precarious situation, much less the destiny of our, our family members and our friends. That's one reason why we might not have great sorrow in our heart. Another is, perhaps our theology is way off. Our theology can be way off. There's three things I think about that. Number one is we're practical universalists. In other words, deep inside, we just think that everybody's going to go to heaven. Deep inside, we just think, you know what, God's a loving God, and people just mess up, and God's just going to, you know, when it's all said and done, He's just going to wink, wink, come on in, it was okay. There's no way God would send my sweet old granny to hell. 
as a second reason our theology might be messed up. And it could be this. We're possibly rendered impotent by an overindulgence of God's sovereignty. Here's what I mean by that. We become so smart about TULIP. We become so smart about election and predestination that we see no need to pray for the lost. We see no need to, to get out there and work and to, to work and work and work so that God might work through us to bring the lost to Christ. We become so infatuated with the sovereignty of God and those, the, the, the doctrines of grace, which are absolutely true, that we just back off and just say, well, if God's going to save my family, He's going to save them. No matter what I do, it won't matter. I'm telling you, that is not biblical. <clears throat> there was a time in my life where... I, 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 I'm really not counting it as when I was converted. I, I was saved as a younger child. <clears throat> but there's a time in my life when, when God just turned the light on. I can just say that. <clears throat> God turned the light on. I, I, was, I, was, I almost said a freshman, but I was uh, a, a relatively new officer in the Navy, and I can just remember one night um, I, I had duty, so I had to, stay in the, um, in the, had to stay on base that night. Had nothing to do but make phone calls, and I started, for whatever reason, I was just so burdened about... My, my family, I just started making long-distance phone calls. I remember I called my mom and daddy. I said, you know, I just had to make it very clear. Do you, do you understand? You know, you're going to die. Do you understand the gospel? And yes, you know, mom and daddy did. I was, you know, assured of that. And I called my mother-in-law. My mother-in-law gave her life to Christ on the phone that night. I didn't stop there. I called my brother. kind of mixing the exact 24-hour period up, but relatively close to that, my brother gave his life to Christ. So did my brother-in-law. But what can happen, and I fight like the Dickens so that it doesn't always happen, but it can. You know, you can get so smart you get so educated in the things of God. You can totally depend on God's sovereignty and, and forget human responsibility. Do you, you understand what I'm saying? You follow me. I pray that not be our case. So, as I'm looking at this, what I've just said to you is the applications. There's two applications. What is our heart like? Either we're lost ourselves, either our theology is messed up, or third, this is probably the worst of all, we're just simply disobedient. Just simply disobedient. Why is my heart not burdened for my neighbor, my family? We're simply disobedient. A second application, the second question is, where are you, and I'll just close with this, where are you in relationship to that Romans road? You know, the theologians, all they talk about what is saving faith. We all know that in order to really know Christ, you have to have faith. What, what does that faith look like? What is saving faith all about? And they've kind of divided it into three parts. They say, they say there's the, 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 the fancy word is notitia, but the word is like notes. It's where we get the word notes from. You've got to understand the story of the gospel. You've just got to understand the, the facts, right? What the Bible teaches. They were all sinners running away from God. We don't by nature run to God. They were born with decrepit hearts. We're, we're born outside of God's family. You're not born in God's family. You're born like a lost sheep. You're, you're born spitting in God's face, running away from God. That's, that's who we are. But God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So th that's the notitia. That's the stuff. You've got to know the stuff. The second thing you've got to do is, is assent to that. You've got to mentally agree that this is true. So I know the story, 
And I agree that it's true. I agree that I'm born separated from God. I agree that man is born separated from God, running away from God. I, I agree with the fact that God sent Jesus who lived a perfect life and whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I agree with that. Guess what? If you believe number one and you believe number two, you're just as good as well off as a demon. The, Bible's, the Bible says that even the demons believe. The demons understand. They know who Jesus is. They believe it to be true. Then what's the difference? It's the third part of saving faith. And it's trust. The word they use is, is where we get the word fiduciary, if you ever heard that before. I know this is the information. I know it's true. And I believe it's true for me. Where are you on that Romans road? I'll just ask you that. I started this message off with a very serious almost dour talk about the fact that you're going to die. You are going to die. Do you understand that? And if you were to die this very day and you were to stand before a holy God and He were to ask you, why should I let you into heaven? Are you absolutely certain that you have the biblical answer, the right answer? If not, you should Today, before you leave the four walls of this building, you should know beyond a doubt that Jesus is your Lord. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Our Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, Paul in the book of Romans. We thank you for... Um, the truth that is so deep and yet it is very easily understood. Lord, please have your way in our lives and our hearts in this very moment. I'm not going to try to play the role of the Holy Spirit, but with no one peeking around and looking, just wondering today if you were here and you go, you know what, preacher, I really don't know Christ. I, I really don't. But right now, I'm not ashamed of that. I, I want to know Christ. I, I want to know beyond a shadow of a doubt when I die, I'll spend eternity in heaven. If that's you, I want you to, to look at me right now. If that's you, you, you say, I don't know Christ, but I want to today. I want you to look at me. Just make eye contact with me. Lord, you know the hearts. Um, please be glorified as we sing to you. In Jesus' name, amen.